So next up, we have um, a keynote that we're very excited about. Microsoft has been a longtime partner and friend of Zscaler. And they recently won the Tech Partner Impact Award of the Year of Awards, excuse me. And um, they will be sharing the work that has been done in over the last year, a couple of years actually, our partnerships, so the deep integrations that we have, and share with you how Microsoft and Zscale are together, the value that they're gonna be deliver, delivering to you. So without further ado, please welcome Bharat Shah, Corporate Vice President of Cloud Security. Thank you, Michelin, for ki your kind words. Uh, and uh, thank you, all of you. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, it's a privilege to be here with our mutual customers and with Zscaler uh, and share some of the things we have learned uh, through our own uh, digital transformation. Uh, so the, the thing, the, this, is the, this is the most amazing time to be in software. Really, I mean, I, I can't tell you how exciting it is in spite of the fact that I work on security, and there's always something or other going on, but this is a fantastic time to be in software. Across the whole universe, uh, customers are using software to reinvent their business models. Every industry is going through dramatic change, and, and really, it is, it's really an awesome place uh, for, uh, for all of us in software to be working. Um, as I said, you know, Microsoft, uh, we started our own digital transformation. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think we are well underway, and, and you, I, I hope you see some of the changes we have made, how we show up to customers, how we are more transparent. If not, come find me. I'd love to hear your thoughts, but we are really changing not only our software and our approach, but our culture, and that's kind of the whole thing about this the digital transformation. I've been at Microsoft long enough to say that uh, this would be, depending on how you count, the fourth big transformation uh, as an engineer I've gone through at Microsoft from DOS to Windows, Windows to Windows NT, client server, cloud, right? And each one of those transformations has produced tremendous economic value for our customers and which in turn has pr produced tremendous value for us. So this is why I'm super excited about this. Uh, but rather than talk about Microsoft and, and our own transformation, I wanted to start this this uh, presentation off with a quick video about one of our mutual Zscalers and Microsoft's uh, customers. And, and let's hear from, in their own words, uh, the, the experience they've had going through this. We are here at Carlsberg headquarters in this room where the pH scale was invented. So research has always been core to Carlsberg. How are you thinking about the role of technology and R&D here at Carlsberg? Carlsberg is a foundation. It's a science and art foundation. As you experience today, we have a lot of work in R&D. To us, digital is a foundation that we want to use to help the company grow into the future. And then we think machine learnings and AI that can really make a huge difference in understanding the product itself. So the thing that's interesting about beer, it's a natural product, right? It starts with the yeast. So learning through AI how these yeast and how the components behave over time is, is a big deal. It's a massive opportunity. You have done so much here at Carlsberg, from better empowering your employees to even changing how you distribute beer at bars, and maybe just share a little bit about the work with customers. A lot of consumer goods, people buy it in the store and they take it home, right. but we have a huge opportunity because we have captive consumers at the bar. Yeah, right. And the connected bar is about how do we really digitize the bar experience to connect it with our consumer. And since we own a lot of the equipment in the bars, it's an opportunity to get a lot of insight and really help people really learn more about beer. Awesome. And you've actually innovated and transformed how you actually distribute the beer itself. Most important to us is the beer itself mm -hmm. and the quality of the beer. And we take that very seriously. The new machine that we came in with is a tap that keeps the beer fresh for a much longer period of time. So by the time it makes it to the bar, people guaranteed fresh beer. As we rolled out this new machine, we put 
the instrumentation on it. Right on. So it can get some real analytics and some real data about what's happening in the bar. That's really cool. Maybe share sort of from a, a business value to the bar owner, what they get out and of it. It's about empowering the bar owner and clean up the supply chain to the bar and helping the bar owner you know, uh, market the right the right product at the right time. And you can do that based on taste profiles of their customers in the bar. Inventory in the back, uh, how much is left in the, in the keg. And, and, and over time is how do we really link that to big events, football events uh, and other events in the neighborhood. And right on. And so forth. I think the, just the opportunity is pretty massive. Right. So better quality uh, through better distribution, more information serving the bar owner, uh, better connection with the customer. So talk about um, your journey to the cloud and using um, cloud services as a way to optimize your operation. Carlsberg in 2007 was just a Scandinavian company. And through the acquisitions and the growth, the company has really gotten its scale. So we never had it like a single common platform to begin with. So since we started here, really now we're migrating most of our infrastructure over the Azure cloud. But the real challenge though, and the real conversation with Microsoft, now that we have it in there, how can we really get some serious value out of it? Right. How can we really leverage the Azure platforms and the technology allowed to connect it to really speed up our deployment of new, new value? Right, on. right, so you get your data state in order and your operations in order, then you can think about how to use yeah. AI and machine learning yes. to actually improve the beer itself. How about any last words of advice you might have for peers of yours in the industry that are trying to go down this digital path what, what kind of words of wisdom might you offer? Be careful what, of the digital lipstick on the pig. And what I mean by that, just don't take old problems and put more shiny tools on them. So this is really, to me, the biggest advice. How can you really think differently about the way you operate because of digital, not just look at what you do and put digital on top of it. Super cool. Well, thanks so much, Mark. I really appreciate no, it. No, thank you for everything. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate the partnership. Thank you for your support. All right, Carlsberg. So, quick question. How many of you have tried a cloud-collected beer? <laughs> Let me tell you, it tastes great and has about one-third the TC of regular beer. And then later on, I'll tell you why it's even more secure. Uh, but like, let's, let's highlight some of the things that Carlsberg kind of expressed. First of all, Carlsberg started their journey, like a lot of what I've heard, uh, from you folks uh, working, uh, first getting their O365 deployments going. They work with Zscaler, redesign the network architecture. That was like the foundation for them to do more. Uh, you heard about the IoT in the tap that actually gets them data, signals, et cetera. That came you know, after they had, got, had gone through this first round of cloud transformation. Uh, but what are the, some of the things that he highlights that I think we'll keep talking about? Number one, great employee experience. Uh, this is a world where innovation is at an all-time high, and good innovation starts with great experiences for employees. So they're really, really focused on great employee experiences. Second, they really, they, he talks about the, the connected bar, but what he really means is there's a really great customer experience every time they are in this bar. Uh, talks about delivering new value to the bar owner. The bar owner with this IoT-infused system can actually do better job dis with distribution, inventory management, quality control, freshness of the beer, all through cloud-connected applications, no matter where the beer uh, is being served. Um, and, and, you know, and so on and so forth. So it's great employee experience, great customer experience, tremendous new value for the bar owner, and great bar experience for both the bar owner and, uh, and the customer. The other thing that kind of, if you didn't uh, kind of catch it in this, this video, the other two things that actually popped out is number one, they had grown through a ton of acquisitions and they're a mishmash of architecture. I don't know if any of you have been through that, but I think that is one of the clear challenges a lot of the uh, organizations go through. And then his words, words of advice were also very, very profound in that, that you know, be bold, uh, get it right, don't put shiny tools on old problems and old architectures, reimagine what you need to do. And I think it all requires 
good hard work, and this is why we're excited that we have Zscaler on one hand, we have Microsoft on the other, we're here to kind of help you through that. Um, very quickly, uh, for a lot of customers, their cloud journey starts with their SaaS application, O365, maybe some Salesforce, maybe some Dynamics 365. But very soon, once they're through that, they, most companies, and I can roll off names after names, Rolls-Royce, Alaska Airlines, Starbucks, they're all using different kinds of IOTs, cloud data, to improve quality, predictive maintenance, better experiences, better customer relationship. But once you get through this, you will actually be inspired to build an even better system by using software everywhere. Uh, you know, everywhere we see customers are using software to reinvent their, their operation, process, operation infrastructure. They're reinventing their business processes. They're infusing technology into their products, making the products much better. They're really building better digital relationships. So this is a fantastic economic opportunity and getting to the cloud is the first real big step uh, in this process. <clears throat> um, very quickly, the same thing, but a very quick different view. We're Microsoft. We are all about empowering people to use software. Uh, we track the growth of software uh, hiring by industry verticals. And what is stunning to me is the fastest growing profession in every of the industry is again software engineers. Again, goes to my point of reinventing, being bold, getting things right, dreaming big, and getting, getting this right. Uh, one stark example here is Tesla. Uh, Tesla, of course, uh, electric cars and all the, all the great things they're doing for uh, green uh, earth is fantastic. But relative to automobile industry, which you know, given their huge supply, uh, machine lines, et cetera, Average automobile uh, industry has about 1% software engineers. Tesla is 7%. Uh, every time I'm in the mall, uh, I like to go for a test drive. And it is a fantastic experience from just being able to check out a car, trying it out, returning it. And they, it's all tracked by their system. It's a fantastic time, again, like I said, to be, to be doing this. Um, so very quickly. You should, you know, we were, we will we'll just very quickly kind of hit on all the points here. The cloud imperatives, you know, it'll start. I mean, a lot of you are all on, on this journey already as you think about how to kind of go uh, get, use O365 from the cloud, other, other SaaS applications. But really, this journey starts, uh, starts very quickly with, you know, we, you have to kind of realize that this digital transformation is not if thing, it is a when thing and a how thing. It is happening, it is an imperative. You just have to go figure out how to actually get on with it to give your customers a better experience. Um, cloud is just the catalyst. Getting to the cloud is the first step. Gone are the days where you need to you know, buy lots and lots of servers and deploy them somewhere and pass them. Cloud just makes this so much easier. It is the catalyst for digital transformation. Uh, we talked about things uh, that Carlsberg said, but I can give you lots of examples. Microsoft's website has something like 25 customers who kind of vouch for the digital transformation they've gone through, uh, and, and it really creates new opportunities. And yes, there are new, new challenges. You know, we, I was in a session, I listened to a couple of panel sessions, the traffic, the network traffic, how do you get there when you adopt cloud? Uh, Zscaler and Microsoft willing to help you think through that. Uh, so th there, are some, uh, there are some opportunities and there are some challenges as well in this. And I think this is all about getting the architecture right. Heard, you heard Carlsberg, I'll repeat again. You'd be tempted to try something but I'd rather kind of you, you, you think through the process, plan, and get the architecture right, and really the experience matters. Bad ex architecture means most likely bad experience, and so you really need to kind of get this thing, uh, thing through. Uh, I, I talk to lots and lots of customers, and uh, you know, it used to be they were cloud averse, but now they are coming to us and asking about security, and it, in a broad sense, security, privacy, uh, geopolitical uh, kind of compliance requirements, et cetera. 
And I think getting the security is actually of paramount uh, importance to get it right. Uh, I started my journey, so in my current job, building security solutions for the cloud with an intent to help customers get to the cloud uh, about four and a half years back. But right now, I fundamentally believe for a large, vast majority of our customers, getting to cloud actually will make their security better. And, and it's a bold statement, but I fundamentally believe that. And I think this is kind of why we need vendors who think similarly, who are bold and brave and willing to work with the customers to kind of help them through get not only their digital transformation right, but fundamentally make them more secure. And this is why I'm here. Uh, it's been a great partnership with Zscaler and I'll kind of show you some of the things we have done with them. But it was fascinating to see how much Zscaler is investing in getting the network architecture right for O365. When you do big data, you'll need that same kind of architecture to really be right, to get your, your, uh, your uh, experiences right. Uh, so, very quickly, what have we been working with Zscaler? For the last two years, we have spent a lot of time building a ton of integration. It all for us starts with Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. Network, very good security boundary, but with mobility, mobile devices, people working from home, it needs help. And we believe that identity as a control plane is a fantastic complement or fantastic help. Every resource you want to protect, you have to put it behind uh, authentication layer, and that actually feeds our control plane as well as helps us with lots of analytics in doing threat detection. So identity is really where it starts, but over time we have actually integrated the entire enterprise mobility and security suite uh, with Zscaler's help to actually build a really good solution. Uh, the heart of the integration is of course what we call as conditional access. Uh, conditional access is just, uh, you know, we look at a bunch of conditions. Where is the user logging in? Are they on a secure uh, machine? Is the, mach is, the, is the device jailbroken? Is it running antivirus? Is it up to date? Uh, which locality they are coming in? Which uh, network? Are they coming from the Zscaler network or some, some uh, network at the airport or from the corporate network? And so we look at all these conditions. Then we have this a uh, really, really good machine learning system in Azure Active Directory that then evaluates based on the condition, the risk of the current session that the user is demanding when he's trying to connect to, uh, uh, to uh, a resource. And then based on that, we actually do lots of controls. We may block the connection. We may say, hey, no downloads, but you can actually read online. Uh, or, or we can actually say, you must MFA before we let, let you in. And the key thing, again, I, I want to kind of point out is a one little, uh, little interesting factoid. The more resources you connect to Azure Active Directory, the more SaaS apps you connect, Azure, uh, AWS, whatever you're using, you connect and go through Azure Active Directory, the wider the aperture and the better we are able to kind of detect, uh, detect anomalies. For example, somebody's reading email from Redmond, but then is trying to access uh, their SharePoint or maybe their box sitting in Lisbon, that's an anomaly. We would definitely flag it. So the more resources you collect and funnel it through our uh, machine learning system, the better our detection is. Uh, so this is the heart and soul of why I think every organization should put all their resources behind the Active Directory boundary. Uh, not only do you get access control, but you, you do get really good detection and in, in, uh, detection that go with it. Uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Intune and Zscaler. Look, I mean, when you have a large distributed system, lots and lots of devices, people using them, to get Zscaler app or Zscaler network provision on all that, Intune is phenomenal at it. Again, it's Intune and AD. You can use AD, AD, target some users, the Zscaler app, and I think Patrick is going to show some of this. It bootstraps the Zscaler network. And, and you know, low TCO and you're up and running. So we have done some great integration with Zscaler and Intune in this slide. Uh, Zscaler and Microsoft Cloud App Security. Uh, again, Zscaler is a fantastic security solution for inbound, but many times you need a security solution for outbound as well. 
and Z scalar complements everything that Z, uh, sorry, uh, CASB, our CASB complements everything that Z scalar does uh, for unsanctioned apps. Uh, and we have other integration where, you know, we have a catalog of about 3,000 apps that we have rated on whether they are compliant, whether they use the right controls, et cetera. We use that catalog to actually feed back into Zscaler to block some of the unsanctioned apps as well if the user is using. So another great set of, set of work uh, across Zscaler and, uh, and uh, our CASB. And finally, I'm super excited that you know, we just launched Sentinel last week. A fantastic reception with customers, but we already have a really good integration uh, with Zscaler uh, that we are, we are bringing into Sentinel. Uh, Sentinel, think about it as a cloud seam, except we have a machine learning leg to it, we have a detection leg to it, uh, but we process all the logs from ZIA and ZPA and other, other firewalls and Zscaler products. Uh, and we have some built-in detections. You go to Zscaler, you go to a site, we know the site is a phishing site, even if Zscaler may not have it, we will help Zscaler block it. Vice versa, Zscaler finds a, a phishing site, it helps your, your SOC um, kind of alert on that. So some great, great integration with Sentinel and, uh, Mac, uh, and uh, Zscaler. Uh, so, with that, let's look a little bit deeper into the network architecture or re-architecture, and I'm going to invite Paul. Uh, Paul is Senior Program Manager in Office 365, uh, and he will walk you through, um, through some, of the, some of the interesting problems, challenges, and solutions. Thanks, Rara. Um Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here to speak to many of you today uh, around connectivity, cloud transformation. And, and my team has the great privilege of working with many of Microsoft's customers and Zscaler's customers to help them through that network transformation as they move to the cloud. And it, it may seem a little odd that Office 365 Engineering are working with customers around network transformation. But the reason is Office is very often the first thing that pushes this door. So it's incumbent on my team to help customers navigate this space to get the greatest success about, around their cloud journey. And that's not just to do with Office or even Microsoft products. That's connecting to whatever, you, whatever it is you may choose to use in the cloud. So what is the problem that we need to solve? I think many of you have probably run into this problem and will know it very well. But the slide that we have here is a simplified um, enterprise network, uh, a traditional approach. Or as someone uh, at the Zscaler event in the USA the, the other week mentioned, it was they'd prefer to call it classic. And th that, that word classic had me thinking about, uh, it's quite analogous with classic cars, in that in their day, they were the best in class. You, know, you couldn't get better, latest technology. But over time, the more money you throw at them, they're still not going to meet the capabilities of a modern car. And I think it is quite analogous. So this, this network is designed for the old on-premises world. The dotted line there is our walled garden, our corp net. And within that walled garden, we have our data, our services, our applications. And we therefore protect that from anything outside which is unknown, untrusted. So our remote users, they're VPNing into that corporate network to get those resources, and if they want to go to the internet, they come back out of that security stack in the middle there. As well as our branch offices, they're using the MPLS circuit to backhaul to our central breakout location. And that central breakout location is expensive in terms of monetary cost for the equipment that's there during DLP, SSL break and inspect, data, you know, all the security functions that those stacks entail. So we've got a monetary cost, but it also comes at a, a latency cost. And latency is currency of cloud services. We don't want latency, because if we have latency, it makes the service feel like it's not on-premises. And the end goal is to deliver that service to your users as if it's delivered locally to them. And that's absolutely achievable with the right network approach. So, and, and I mentioned, we, from my team, like to think about this holistically. We have a set of problems with Office 365 connectivity through this model. 
Um, but it's important to remember the, the same issues that we run into in terms of adding latency to go to these services, loading that application, the firewalls, the proxies with connections that weren't there before. They apply to access to Microsoft Azure if we're going to public or even private space through this stack. Windows and Office updates, another big change that we see customers run into issues with. We used to roll out a service pack every couple of years and somebody would go around with a DVD or a USB drive and roll them out or you know, this sort of thing. But now they come thick and fast because the client has to keep up with the rapid change in the cloud. As we add new features, that client has to keep up with it. So the updates come thick and fast. And that can cause problems with this model as well, overwhelming those MPLS circuits as we backhaul to that central location. And as I mentioned, it's important to remember this is, this is a cloud problem. The same problems you will run into running to any cloud service as well. So back to Office 365, we have a set of connectivity principles that we've built to solve this problem. And while they are specific to Office, most of them are pretty applicable to any other cloud service, as I say. So first of this is to differentiate traffic. We look at the Office 365 endpoints, and what we don't want to be doing is treating access to those endpoints in the same way as a user going to an unknown, untrusted website. Quite rightly, we break and inspect. We make sure that's an allowed site. It's not bringing anything in or out that we don't want. But from an Office perspective, you've trusted Microsoft to be custodians of your data. Do we need to be breaking and inspecting that traffic as it flows out of the environment. And I always ask the question, when you had Exchange on-premises, did you break and inspect the client connectivity of the service then? Hopefully the answer is no. We deliver security as the mail comes into the service. So what you've done is move that Exchange service into Microsoft's cloud. So it doesn't make sense to deliver uh, security on those endpoints as it goes through the network egress. It's much more efficient to so, do that. Paul, I uh, you know, heard a lot about this hairpin architecture, um, something you can, you're going to talk about. And, and I think it's also important that I think you said it, but I want to make sure that, that uh, it is actually something people hear that this is, nothing, this is not necessarily particular to Office 365. It's a general problem with cloud. Indeed. Um, you can see in the middle two, um, uh, principles there around egressing locally and optimizing route length. Um, why do we want this? Wouldn't it make logical sense? Let's say we are in Australia and my tenant is in Europe. Does it not make sense to use my own MPLS? I own that network. I control it to get that traffic back and I drop it off at Microsoft Store in Europe. Well, the answer is no, because Microsoft has one of the largest networks in the world that's designed to carry your traffic from A to B as quickly as possible. And further to that, Microsoft has what we call service front doors for Office 365 locally in the edge of our network. So if you egress your office traffic in Sydney, Australia, it doesn't matter where your tenant lives, in Europe, for example, you'll be able to talk to the service front door, an exchange server in, in Sydney, a, what we call Azure front door for SharePoint and OneDrive in Sydney, uh, a Teams media server, Transport Relay in Sydney, if we do that local breakout. And this is how we're able to deliver the service as if it's local rather than across the other side of the planet in Europe. Um, optimizing route length as well. If we're connecting to the service, we want pretty much as straight as an arrow connectivity. We want to egress that traffic in Sydney, Australia, and we want to take the quickest path to there. And that means not hairpinning through uh, third-party cloud, or even Microsoft's cloud solutions. We don't want the traffic for Office 365 going into Azure. It doesn't make sense, as I said before, because we run a lot of the service at the edge of that network, very close to your users. So it's important that we try and optimize that path between your users and the front door of the service. And finally, assessing network security. We, we look at those endpoints we've differentiated before, and we look at them and say, well, for Outlook connectivity. We've got Exchange Online Protection running, which does its thing. We can run Office ATP against those endpoints. We've got AV scanning that was involved with all that. The security that is traditionally done at the network edge is done at a much more efficient level within the application where it's not going to cause a bottleneck for you. And with that, Microsoft 
drives connectivity to these principles. And the easiest way to achieve them for the core traffic is to send them direct. But it's often not possible for a customer to do that for simplicity reasons, for central visibility and control reasons. So when you pick a partner in the space, it's critical that you ensure that that partner aligns to these principles as, good as, as well as possible. Um, and with that in mind, we've built the Microsoft Office 365 Network Partner Program to uh, accredit customers, or partners rather, who are, have products that align to this. And I'm pleased to say Zscaler are one of the first um, partners that are aligned to this. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about this at our Ignite conference in uh, November. And with that to wrap up, I'll, I'll show you, you can see on the screen there, the impact of this model. So this is a, a customer case study um, where we have a customer in Sydney, Australia, using that model I described before, the backhaul on their own MPLS, egressing Europe through a centralized security stack doing DLP, SSL inspection, et cetera, and getting really, really poor performance, unusable performance of the OneDrive service, taking uh, 120 seconds there to move a 30 meg file to the point where these users think this service is terrible. Why can't I have my data locally in Australia? Well, switching the connectivity to follow those four principles, local breakout, local DNS resolution, hitting Microsoft service front doors in Sydney, we've not moved the data here and the difference you can see. If I remember that was around seven seconds to move that same file as opposed to 120. No smoke and mirrors, just purely moving the connectivity to align with those principles. So that's the impact having the right connectivity approach can have for Office and anything else that aligns with these principles. And with that, I'll pass back to Brett. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, uh, uh, we're going to have Patrick join me here. And uh, all the integrations I talked about, he's going to kind of re-highlight some of those uh, by doing a quick demo. Patrick? Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. So we thought we would, uh, I, I won't show you a bunch more slides. We're going to give you a story and do it in the context of a demo kind of highlight all the different integrations that we've done with Microsoft through the years, because there's actually quite a bit. When I, you'll see that as I, as I draw out this slide. So we've, through the years, been building integrations across lots of different products. So naturally, we've got uh, one of our first integrations was when a user is going to the internet, they're often going to 365. You heard in the morning that that's the number one cloud app destination for traffic from our cloud. So we had to make sure that was a very fast performant experience. And so Paul walked you through a lot of the things we've been doing there. But we didn't stop there with private access. That put us squarely in the path of when a user is accessing applications that are in Azure or workloads that are, in essence, have moved off-prem. We have an integration there, which I'll walk you through. We had to integrate identity with Azure AD and uh, on-prem AD as well. We, uh, we had to have a way to manage the devices that the employees are using. And uh, we did that through Intune partnerships and APIs. We, uh, we launched last year, if you saw uh, our user conference last year, we launched Microsoft uh, Cloud App Security integration. That was one of the demos we did. And then most recently, we added Azure Sentinel to the, to the stack, so to say. And that basically allows logs to stream from our platform out into Sentinel for investigation. So to kind of tie this together, I'm going to give you a story. And this story is a day in the life of a user of Zscaler and Microsoft. And uh, I thought there'd be no one better to pick on than me. So this is going to be me, Patrick, as a user of these two services. If you know anything about me, you realize I have a lot more devices than this. But uh, for the purposes of the demo, I'll keep it simple. And we'll, we'll focus on just some common devices that are, that are in use. And so the first integration here is because I've got devices, I need to instrument them to make sure that they're always going through Zscaler. And uh, the starting point for that is Intune. So Microsoft's uh, Intune service is capable of managing all these different endpoints. So you'll see here's Intune. And in our case, we use Intune to distribute our Zscaler app down to the end devices. And that instruments them with not just the app that gets traffic to our cloud, but then 
that's basically the platform for Zia, for ZPA, and everything else that we end up doing. And that integration with Intune is very rich. So if I show you, I'm going to pivot into the Intune UI, and I zoom in on it, you'll see that with Intune, we're literally just a predefined dropdown. There's no crazy configuration that you have to do to be able to do this kind of instrumentation. You literally choose, I'm going to choose Zscaler in the dropdown, and that's it. And so, if I show you my actual device in the spirit of better together, this is my laptop right now. I forgot to change my wallpaper for the demo, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it to something a little more business appropriate and uh, show you guys my Z app running on my end device. So there's the, uh, the Zscaler app that's been pushed down by Intune. The first thing a user would do is if they want to, uh, when it first comes down, if you want to have them authenticate, you can, you can do that. And so when the user authenticates to the Zscaler app, you'll see that this is the second step of our integration, which is tying into Azure AD from an identity perspective. And so when a user tries to authenticate to the Zscaler app, you'll see that this is an Azure AD login screen that you're probably very familiar with. That was very easy to deploy. Here's uh, pivoting into the Azure UI. If you look, they have a concept of, that's called the Azure Gallery. And in the Azure Gallery, you can search for Zscaler. And it's literally one click to do that integration between Azure AD and Zscaler. And there's lots of documentation across the two products, but it's literally click Add, and that's all that's necessary there. So if I continue the story, let's say I have an app that's running in Azure. A very common app that ends up running in Azure quite often is uh, SAP. And so in a similar way where I just showed you the Azure uh, AD gallery, there's a marketplace in Azure itself. And if you want to deploy SAP in Azure and give users access to SAP without exposing it to the internet in a zero trust way without an attack surface, uh, you can do that because in, uh, in the Azure, in Azure marketplace, there's a connector that's already there. You just search for ZPA connector. And you'll see you can create it and even get started with a preset configuration. So it's literally one click to drop this connector in your Azure VNet. And all of a sudden then, any user that has the app is able to access SAP without having to open up any holes or any firewall port ports or policies to allow that user to access SAP. So if I go back to my demo, the real key point here is that the user experience is great because all the end user has to do is access SAP the exact same way they would have any other application because the Z app has already been pushed down by Intune and uh, the connector just needs to run next to SAP in Azure and that's it. So that gets us to uh, another step of our integration. So Paul already walked you through all the, the benefits of breaking out traffic at the edge, not, not hairpinning or backhauling the traffic. I'm not going to do any of that from a demo perspective. But um, obviously, 365, one of the easiest things to demo for 365 is uh, your email. So I'll launch Microsoft Outlook on this, uh, on this laptop. And uh, you'll see here, hopefully in a minute, a very timely email will come in. There's an email from Jay. I think he just sent it to me in the front row. And if I zoom in on this email, you'll see that uh, Jay's approved my first ever PTO request. So naturally, what am I going to do? I'm here in uh, Lisbon today, so I'm going to get a plane, and I'm going to go somewhere else uh, and, and take that PTO. And so in this day in the life of, use, uh, of a user of Microsoft and Zscaler, my, you heard from Paul all the reasons why my email experience is going to be still very fast and assured, but there's a lot of other things that are happening uh, as a user roams around the world. And uh, that brings me to my next one. So Microsoft Cloud App Security, we launched, uh, like I mentioned, last year. And basically what this is allowing to happen is me as a user, when I'm on my device, let's say I'm in Cape Town and I'm browsing the internet, I'm still getting, even though I'm not on the corporate network, even though I'm not uh, you know, behind a, a controlled access point, I'm still getting all of my security. The security is following me wherever I go on those, uh, on those airplane slides. And so we have done the integration not just from a policy perspective, but also from reporting and analytics. So here's a screenshot of the MCAS UI. And you'll see that, or I'm sorry, of the Zscaler UI. And you'll see that we're syndicating data in from MCAS. So not only are we showing cloud app visibility and that they exist in your environment, but then we're also attributing it with data that's coming from Microsoft. You can see why we like or dislike certain applications. And there's a button there at the bottom that says Explore with MCAS. And so that button allows a single sign-on integration into the Microsoft MCAS, or what's called Cloud App Security UI now. And uh, this is the Microsoft UI. And you'll see they have a concept of sanctioned and unsanctioned apps. And so in, in my demo, 
an unsanctioned app would be anything that's going to do data exfiltration on my device. So as I'm browsing the internet in, uh, in Cape Town, as an example, you'll see that uh, when I try to go to a data exfiltration site, this is the actual, this is the Zscaler block page, and it's saying I'm not able to go to, in this case, filedropper.com because MCAS has pushed a policy. It's a real-time integration between the two clouds. MCAS has put a policy that says this is an unsanctioned app. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a story of how we're integrated with MCAS. Now, there's a couple things that just happened. I was in US uh, yesterday. I'm, in, I'm here in Europe today. I'm going to South Africa tomorrow because Jay approved my PTO. And then I also started to access data exfiltration sites. So that's naturally in any good security operation, continuous security monitoring ecosystem, that's going to set off some alarms. And so our most recent integration you'll see was with, uh, with Sentinel, with Azure Sentinel that was uh, that, that's a newer offering from Microsoft. And so that would be a great place for, let's say, a SOC or a security engineer to start investigating why is this happening? Is Patrick compromised because all these weird things just happened? And so here's a screenshot of, uh, if I log into the Azure UI for Sentinel, you'll see we've got Zscaler dashboards. And these dashboards show threat activity over time. Basically, we, we have the ability to export all of the insight and all the data that we have in our services into Sentinel for you then to be able to take action on it. And by the way, correlate it with everything else you would have going into Sentinel, like Azure AD logs. Uh, you'll see in, in, the, in the context of this demo, one of the things we're gonna wanna do is, Patrick's not compromised. Let's say we, we, that was the outcome of the Sentinel investigation. And we actually need to add Patrick to a, glo a global roaming users group uh, that exists in Azure AD. Now, when you, in the past, would add a user to a group, that would generally take a little bit of time to be able to sync. And so one of the things we also released in the last year was uh, Azure AD's always had conditional access that, that in essence is changing my access based on different attributes like a risk score like I just showed you. But uh, we also launched skim integration, which basically means if I show on the Azure app UI, you have the ability to turn on skim. And if you're not familiar with skim, it does quite a few things. But in the purpose of this context, it will allow group membership to be synced in a real time method. So, when I'm going to add a user to a group, that is an API call that can be pushed to notify Zscale in real time and will update the policy in real time, which is pretty powerful. So you turn on skim in the Azure UI, and now I've pivoted over and I'm showing you the Zscale or private access UI, and you'll see we're syncing in skim group membership now. In this case, global roaming users maybe relax security because the user's going to be moving around a bunch. And uh, that's all that's necessary to then restore my access and so if I go back to my desktop, you'll see uh, my new wallpaper that you may have seen this morning. That's a very good end user experience when you have these kinds of attributes coming through very quickly. So hopefully that gave you just a little bit of a story of a day in the life of a user in Zscaler and Microsoft. There's a lot of integrations, and uh, that gave you hopefully a perspective of um, all the different areas that we've uh, been building out over the years. So with that, thank you very much. So that was uh, all the cool work Microsoft and Zscaler have been doing for the last two, two and a half years. And with that now, I'm going to invite Eves, Technip uh, FMC. Eves, come on over. Uh... OK, uh, so I'm the Global Cybersecurity Operations Manager for Technip FMC. I'm based in Paris, uh, but Technip FMC is a global, um, is a, a global corporation, and I'm going to show you a, a small video about a company, and then we will talk briefly then. Okay, so you guess we were for the oil and gas market. 
So, uh, it would be great uh, for you uh, to tell us a little bit about your own journey to the cloud. What did you do? How did you go about it? Um, and, and where are you in the journey? What all uh, you have going on? Yep, so we started, I started the journey as an um, employee of Technip back in 2015. And it was, the journey started, let's say, almost at the same moment, both with O365, 2015, and with Zscaler as well. So let's say both have been helping us, uh, the one another, um, and really um, uh, Zscaler helped us in a very highly distributed environment where we didn't have the, the, the management, the firewall management globalized. Uh, they helped us adopting O365. So the journey, uh, we, grow, we grew up uh, and it's a long journey. Now we, uh, we have completely adopted O365 and specifically after the merge, which was a, a, a major event back in 2017. So we merged, Technip merged with FMC. We became Technip FMC in 2017. And now we are full, fully, tech, we are fully O365, and it represents almost 50% of the, of the whole traffic uh, toward the internet. Wow, that's exciting. So you not only took on this journey, but two big organizations merged and you still continue through this thing. So that's, that's very, very, very exciting. You also mentioned that you have some other upcoming challenges. Uh, you wanna share, share a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, so I probably will not be too talkative about it, but we, it's been announced a couple of weeks ago that we will be spinned off in two different companies. So after two years and a half of, of being merged, and the merge is not completely over, but already, Already the company has decided to split, uh, to split into two companies with a spin-off uh, in two different areas. And that's a big challenge again. So if you were to kind of look back on all the things you did, what were the few key learnings that you would want to share with others? And so that, you know, it, I'm, I'm sure most of them are already going through this, but any learning you have that, that, that others can learn. Sure. I, I know I, I would love to learn more as well. Sure. So um, it's important to, to follow the recommendations. So Microsoft re recommendation to, to, uh, dis to distribute the internet access the closest to, to the, so the users must, be, must reach the internet the fastest. So that's, that's a key, key element. Uh, being simple also, um, avoid having multiple components and security or any, any other type of components. I would also recommend with regard, so Zscaler, I would recommend Zscaler as well, but in a, in a way also of uh, following the, the best practices of Zscaler. Uh, so, and the last recommendation, not the least, is make sure that you treat all the components uh, all the chain that, that is between the users and the applications over the internet as a whole and not as a stack of separate components that work completely separately. So simplicity, good experience, treat the whole system as one rather than kind of thing. Absolutely. Did you end up uh, going through this? Uh, did, did you, do you feel great about the TCO actually being lower? Uh, for the whole solution and uh, just uh, some, some thoughts on how you went about that. So it's not, not only the TCO, but it's also the user experience because it helps the, the so the, the, cloud, the cloud era is, is great for the user because it, 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 leverage, it leverages uh, lots, of, uh, lots of abilities, new abilities for the users and, and doing it successfully is, is not specifically going into having a lower TCO, but it's having a lower TCO because it, it, it allows the user making more with the same amount. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I remember about eight, nine years back, traveling and having to VPN into our on-premise exchange servers was a terrible experience. And now, you know, whether I'm in the plane or whether I'm in India or, you know, Lisbon, you know, we get, we got, I've got the same great experience. So this is a great story. Uh, and thank you very much for coming over and sharing this. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for uh, having you know, a long day, 5 p.m. and a little over, uh, but it is great having you here. We'll be around for a bit more. If you have any questions, 
uh, would be happy to entertain. But I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, my host, the Zscaler, for actually giving me this privilege of being here and getting to hear from the customers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you so much. Great. Well, hopefully you enjoyed learning about a bunch of integration we had done. I talked about early, earlier that integration to make deployments easier, operational job easier is a high, high priority for us.